Monaco, no? Um, so welcome to lecture number 21. Uh, we are going to uh, discuss today uh, continental strike slip faults, but I'll also show you oceanic ones as well, but mostly about continental strike slip faults. So this is this uh, strike slip regime. And uh, we are going to see these concepts of transfer faults, transform faults, which are uh, very close, transfer and transform, but they are different from transcurrent. Transcurrent is different. And then we'll see what happens when these uh, strike slip faults, they have bends or step overs. Yeah. So what happens in those regions? Because it's interesting what happens. And um, those regions suffer the formation in the regime of transtension and transpression. So a lot of new terminology might be for you, but very interesting things. Um, so I started this image from the Fawson textbook of the very famous, uh, very famous San Andreas Fault in California. Now, the San Andreas Fault, uh, what we'll see today, um, it is basically uh, according to the terminology you have seen, it is a transform fault. Now, a transform fault is um, a particular case of a transfer fault because what happens, the transform fault is a plate boundary. So uh, if we look here, uh, it says looking south. So we look to the south here. And what you see here is basically uh, on, the, on the right side of the image, uh, it's the uh, Pacific plate. And uh, on, on the other side is the uh, North American plate. Yeah? So it's a plate boundary. And you can see, uh, you can see the, oh, sorry for this. Uh, you can see the displacement here. Uh, you see this uh, river, this stream, and its course was ob obviously offset. Uh, it is a dextra, it is a dextral fault. So what happens is the offset, the, the movement is like this, yeah? Um, as you stay on one side, the other side moves to the right. All right, so we, we are gonna look again at the San Andreas fault and some other faults. I think this is very interesting, um, but just a bit of theory here. So very simple, you see the diagram to the left, yeah? And what what the, uh, the image to the left and what it shows basically is, you know, strike slip faults. You have the displacement vector parallel uh, to the surface of the earth. And um, as you can see in this image, basically it says that uh, the pure strike slip faults show no offset in any section if layers are vertical yeah, uh, or horizontal uh, or strike parallel to the fault. So this image, yeah, you see the layers horizontal. You have the displacement. And if you take a cross section, you are not going to see it. So that's why if it were only for this very simple structure in a seismic section, you might not realize that you have a strike slip fault. Yeah? Uh, similarly here, yeah, because the, the, the strike of the layers is parallel to the fault. And when it comes to uh, what happens to these faults at depth, you see, depending on where we are in the brittle part of the crust or the, um, the plastic, uh, the part that suffers plastic, uh, that deforms by uh, plastic deformation mechanisms, um, you have basically um, this part in the brittle part, we call it the strike slip fault. If in the deeper part, it is a strike slip shear zone because you have plastic deformation mechanism. But it's the same structure, yeah? Um, and you can see that uh, basically it's not always that you have one vertical fold going down into the lower crust, not necessarily. You can have these um, detachment planes, detachment surfaces that connect two segments yeah, of the fold that are vertical uh, and uh, they connect them. So this can be various situations. Now, let's move into the concepts. Transfer faults, and you'll see in the, I think that in the textbook of, uh, in this textbook, uh, this one, uh, the distinction between transfer and, tra and transform 
is not very well explained or except in the you have a table with various terms but in the text when you read the text it's kind of a bit of a mix and uh, uh, might you might be confused but in the other textbook in the Fawson textbook it's very clear yeah so the the, the concept is presented in a very clear manner so what happens here when we call you know the word transfer you transfer something from one place to another so as you can see this fault basically connects other structures yeah we have this uh, we have this uh, normal faults and basically uh, as you can see they connect the movement from here to uh, here yeah so the basically these normal faults are in two different planes they are not coplanar and the movement kinematically is connected by this strike slip transfer fault and here in the case of a reverse situation yeah you see this here you have a reverse fault and here you have one and you you see kinematically what happens so i think that the idea of tra transfer fault is a very simple and powerful concept for us to think okay it connects different structures kinematically it has to transfer the movement yeah to make sense mechanically uh, so this is the idea of transfer fault and here are some other examples so so uh, you see if you look at the diagram to the left uh, to the bottom again normal faults but the difference from the previous uh, previous slide if you look here the two normal faults they dip in the same direction here they dip in opposite di directions yeah but you can see uh, how the movement happens along the transfer fault now here is you see these are someone's uh, hikers here uh, <laughs> the tip of uh, the feet so at this at this scale you see very small yeah in an outcrop or uh, whatever you have these two these um, uh, extension fractures and this is a transfer fault so um, obviously you have here the formal definition they transfer displacement in between two extension or contraction faults by this means of strike slip motion all right, so um, now from transfer faults, you see, I, I, I have this title in green here and a different shade of green, transform faults. It's a particular case, yeah? Because th these transform faults, they are plate boundaries, yeah? You, you, we learned about the divergent, the convergent and the transform plate boundaries. So what happens, I have shown you at mid-ocean ridges uh, when we discussed about plate the theory of plate tectonics, and I was showing you these segments. And the idea is that mechanically, the movement, if you have divergent movement, seafloor spreading, yeah, you have seafloor spreading in this top segment and in this bottom segment. So the along this segment that unites the two the two ridges, yeah, that unites, you have to have this. Uh, strike slip movement to mechanically make sense. So the fault is just here. Beyond this, we have inactive fractures. Yeah, you no longer have relative displacement because here is the same plate. Yeah, here is the same plate. Here is the same plate. Whereas here are two separate plates. So they the transform faults are plate boundaries, and um, you can see our situations it's not only a ridge to ridge you see a transform fault um, linking here and connecting the the ridge with an arc and connecting uh, now with, where, where uh, you see arc here that means subduction here yeah so subduction with subduction you see these things so obviously you understand the idea of what uh, the various situations of transform faults um, exist now here is uh, we we look at the map of the uh, atlantic ocean and you see here the south america and africa and you see the the mid ocean ridges the spreading segments in light green and then the transform faults you see them the transform faults linking the various segments of the uh, ridges and beyond beyond the two points that link the ridges, you see they are fracture zones. They are no longer active, all right? So this is what happens 
in the oceans. But now let's look at the uh, transform faults, very famous transform faults on the continents. And one of them is, Joanna, I started the, the course with, and um, this is the San Andreas Fault. As you can see, it is a fault system here. So we don't have just one fault. We have the major fault. You see the dextral major fault in blue here. This is a San Andreas. But there are many other faults that uh, uh, take various movements there. It's, it's a zone of deformation, obviously. You have another fault here as a conjugate fault, as you can see, called Garlock fault, which is sinistral. So this is dextral, this is sinistral. But you can see, you can see that it separates the North American plate from the uh, Pacific plate. And basically the displacement rate would be an average of six centimeters per year. Yeah. Um, and you can, read, you can read the text on, on, uh, on your own. Uh, as you know, this fault is on the one hand, the most studied fault on earth. Yeah, so uh, a lot of research has been done, but it is also the locus of strong earthquakes, so this troublesome uh, earthquakes. All right, so another one, uh, very, very famous, is in Turkey. So you see in Turkey, what we have here is a very complex zone geologically and very interesting. Um, and we have what is called the North Anatolian Fault, you see, North Anatolian Fault. Um, and the uh, you have a conjugate fault here called the East Anatolian fault. Uh, both of them are strike slip. Now, very troublesome. This one, uh, the North Anatolian fault, recurrent earthquakes, very powerful earthquakes with lots, lots of uh, casualties, like uh, people that died like tens of thousands. Uh, in and in more recent times, I'm I, in the last. I would say in 30 years, there were several big earthquakes that uh, had um, big death tolls. So uh, this is a famous continental transfer fault, as you can see to the north, the Eurasian plate, to the south, what is called this micro plate, the Anatolian plate. And as you can see here, the Arabian plate and further down, it's not in the image, it's the African plate. And we have a complex system kinematically here, but as you can see the Anatolian plate, this is, I will end this talk with what is a crustal escape, if you want. So as you can see, this squeezing of the Anatolian plate uh, between these two strike slip folds, yeah? And you see the movement. All right, so um, very interesting. Another one, let's move here to uh, New Zealand. And New Zealand, Geologically speaking, if you talk to someone about New Zealand as a country and uh, you start talking about the geology of New Zealand, uh, it has two islands, the North Island and the South Island. And the South Island is very famous for the Alpine Fault. And this is the Alpine Fault, as you can see it here. Yeah, uh, um, it, it has uh, some place here, like a horse tail here, uh, as it goes towards the uh, North Island. But you can see that this system connects these two subduction zones, and the subduction zones are dipping oppositely. Yeah, so you can you can think about the uh, the movement, and as you can see, the movement obviously led to some um, compression here. It's an oblique an oblique movement, as you can see. So very interesting system. And there are people who study the Alpine Fault in uh, New Zealand and do modeling on it and so on. Now, let's move to the other, uh, to the other uh, <laughs> term, transcurrent fault. So we, we talked about transfer faults. So they link structures. And the particular case is the transform faults that are plate boundaries. Now, transcurrent faults is the other type of strike slip faults. And what the main difference between these two is that the transcurrent ones, they don't link other structures. They die out, yeah? So they basically 
they have free tips. Yeah, it's like the faults we talked about in the structural geology part of the course. They have free tips. So as they accumulate strike slip displacement, uh, they grow in length. So when you, you have to be very careful when you refer to a strike slip fault, if you have to think about, is it a transcurrent or is it a transfer fault? Yeah, to be precise when you write a, a report or a technical text. Um, and they form within the plates and are intraplate faults, whereas the transform faults that we discussed are plate boundaries, they are interplate uh, faults. Now, they obviously they intersect the surface of, of the earth, but what happens at depth is that some of these uh, transcurrent faults may end in a different, against a, a different structure, could be another thrust fault, an extension fault, or a subduction zone like depicted here, yeah? But the fault itself, it has three tips. It starts from one point where the displacement is zero, yeah, or the, it's plastic deformation and ends at another point. So there is no, no structure to connect to another structure. All right. Now, how they end, how they end. And uh, these are some examples of how uh, they end. Look at this, at this diagram, yeah? terminations along transparent faults. And here, for instance, if the movement is like this, you see it dextral, yeah? And you see what, what basically would happen. It would pull, like if it, ter it, it terminates in a, what's called a horse tail. Horse tail, the, the tail of the horses has many strands, yeah? So there are many strands. So you have all these uh, little faults, this place. And the displacement is taken over, and if they curve in this way, you see it's gonna be, these are gonna be normal faults, yeah, and normal faults. And basically, this is what the terrain would look like. Whereas if, if they curve in the other direction, you see then you have compression here, yeah, compression. So this would be thrust faults, yeah. So this is one way in which transcurrent faults can terminate with this place, this arrays yeah, of small faults, a horse there. Or as I mentioned, they can disappear into zones of plastic strain. So you no long, longer see uh, basically the loss of cohesion and of brittle deformation. All right. Um, now there is something that is, I would say quite important. We imagine these strike slip faults as going, you know, straight forward, but they do have bends. I mean, they are not going to be perfectly straight. Sometimes they have bends, and some other times they have what's called step overs. So you see the step over. Basically, it's like there is a region where the fault continues into a different plane. Yeah. So it steps over. And and you can see here. Um, this is the definition of a step over, yeah? And what happens in these places, you see, we have here a dextral, a dextral fold, yeah? And you, you see here um, that you, you, form, you form contractional or uh, extensional structures in these step overs or if you had a bend, okay? So basically, depending on how you step over, you step to the left or to the right, and the type of the fault, sinistral or dextral, you can get a situation where you have basically contractional structures or you have extensional uh, structures, yeah? So here we are, gonna, uh, we are gonna look at an example, look at this diagram. So it says like this, Let's say you have this uh, this strike slip fault and it has a bend or a step over, yeah? So a releasing bends form where a sinistral strike slip fault steps to the left. So sinistral means it moves, this block moves to the left. Yeah, we stand on this one, it moves to the left. If we stand on this one, this one moves to the left. So you can imagine this block, it's, let's say you walk here, there is a path and you walk and you walk and you walk. You are a geologist. And then here you are losing the fault because the fault steps to the left. 
So this is what the text says here. You have a sinistral striated fault and it steps to the left. What happens? You have a releasing band. It releases, it, it creates basically uh, extensional. Uh, yes, yes, Gabriel. Um, this kind of faults are also uh, uh, originate. Does they originate also uh, uh, topography? Yes, yes, they generate this. These areas, uh, these areas here, they do have topography, definitely, Gabriel, because you have a region that suffers extension locally. So the uh, uh, the topography, the basic surface, is gonna drop down, and here, here, it suffers compression. So you you create a little a little uh, origin there. So you are uh, you are right. So if you remember the image, the photograph I've shown you at the beginning, you've seen the San Andreas fault, but you've seen that there are some compression ridges on the sides, yeah, because um, because in that oh, case, yes. not yes, necessarily no, because it had a bend, but also because the movement, the stress movement might be oblique. So it has a component of compression, not only of strike step. I'll show you in a bit. But I think you're you're I, I'm pretty glad you asked me, Gabriel, because this is true. You do get depression or little uh, little uh, origins. And uh, I'm gonna show you some famous examples. Yeah, definitely. Teacher. So, yes. I can see these structures are also really similar to something that we can find in a smaller in a smaller rocks that are the mineral fish. That they are a product of these types of efforts that one of oh, the formation, uh, yeah, could be, could be, um, at a small scale, at a small yes, scale. at a smaller scale. That yeah, is yeah. a mineral that forms when we have oblique. Um, yes, uh, yeah, yeah. The cisaya. All, always, if you think, David, in terms of um, of the, uh, we are looking at mechanics here. So the deformation, how it is taken over, yeah. If here, obviously, to kinematically basically have coherence here, you must extend this area. Yeah, it looks like a little fish, <laughs> a nice structure. Yes. Okay, I understand. Um, so these structures are called uh, strike slip duplexes. Yeah. So you can have an extensional duplex or a contractional one. Yeah. If it's extensional contraction. Now, in the case of the extensional ones, we have also the term called pull apart basins. Pull apart because you pull apart the crust and you form a basin. As, Ga as Gabriel was asking, yeah, definitely we, we are going to have topography created. So uh, let's, go, let's have, now you understand, you understand, I'm pretty sure from this diagram, everything. So, Let's look at some famous uh, pull apart bases. One of them is what's called the Death Valley in California. Now, there are movies, Western uh, movies, yeah, uh, where you, ha you have uh, the characters uh, crossing whatever the Western United States and getting to the Death Valley, and it's very difficult for them and so on. The reason is because the valley, it's quite spectacular. I visited it once um, and I would advise you, and I, I think I told you, if you have the chance to go to the uh, Estados Unidos and you can choose where to go, I, I advise you to go to the western part because you would be impressed with the geology. I mean, you, you can see many, many uh, uh, things, geologically speaking. So if you go to California and have time, rent a car, and drive to the Death Valley, but don't do it in the summer months, which means in uh, July, August or something, because the temperature here is like 50 degrees. Do it in the winter months, like December, November, January, February, things like this. Uh, and it's gonna be very pleasant, like 25 degrees, yeah? Very nice. Um, it's a desert. Um, what happens, you see here the geologic map. So basically this is a pull apart basin that was formed uh, and you had basically this depression. 
and we come to to Gabriel's question. Yeah. Now the depression is very severe because the basin floor uh, in some parts is below the sea level, so it's the lowest point in the North American continent. It's the lowest point. Um, what is also very impressive, and uh, I cannot really convey this through this image, but I think that I'm if I'm gonna tell you that the mountains on each side, so think about this, the floor of the valley, but an altitude of zero or below zero. And the mountains on each side uh, are like 3000 meters. So the scale of things, the scale is just unbelievable. Like uh, you can see here in the distance, this area, these are called alluvial fans. So these are sediments that from the erosion of the peaks, yeah, you get these alluvial fans. These fans, as you can see from the bottom of the valley to the top of the fan, only the fan is like 1000 meters difference in elevation. The scale of the things is just impressive. And this is a, a very famous pull apart basin, just created through this, <laughs> uh, through this situation. Yeah. So here, here you are, Gabriel. This is topography. <laughs> yes. Impressive. All right. Let's move to another one, very famous. Uh, from all points of view, this is a part of the world which is um, is suffering a lot, suffering politically, as you know, in the Middle East with the state of Israel and the Arab states surrounding it and uh, all the problems that are there politically, but also geologically, as you can see, a lot of suffering and of of uh, structures and uh, and movements that are transferred from one part to the other. So as you can see, uh, you, this is a Sinai Peninsula. It's part of Egypt, yeah? But now as we go from the uh, Eilat here is a city, the southernmost city in Israel, in the state of Israel. Right here next to Eilat is basically Jor Jordan, yeah? Uh, the, country. So what happens here is that, as you can see, more or less the border with Jordan of Israel uh, is marked by by this um, this fault. As you can see, this strike slip fault or strike slip fault system, which is called the Jordan structure. And it's a large transform fault system. And as you can see, it connects with the uh, spreading ridge in this new oceanic basin, very new oceanic basin, which is the Red Sea. Yeah, it, uh, it connects this um, with a subduction zone. It's a very complicated system, as you can see, with the uh, Cypress subduction zone here. And here is a, uh, the uh, Palmyrian uh, fault belt, which, is, which has suffered, basically, it's a little origin uh, related to the pushing, as you can see, to the pushing here. Um, at the north of the Jordan uh, structure. But here we have a valley, and this is a Dead Sea Valley. And as you can see, the Dead Sea um, is the uh, lowest point on Earth, on the continents. I think it's minus 400 uh, in elevation. And uh, very famous, as I said, historically, uh, from a religious point of view, uh, politically, so it's a hot spot. <laughs> but geological, also, it's a, it's a, what you can see a, a pull apart basin, yeah, um, related to to this uh, transform uh, fault system. All right. So um, a, a satellite image, what I was showing you, yeah. Uh, Teacher, I have a question. Yes, Gabriel. Does it connect to the to the emergent uh, divergent emergent of uh, of the Red Sea? Yes, here you see here at the bottom. This is the mid ocean, uh, the spreading ridge of the Red Sea. So yes, so it does in order to this, I want to ask you if this is some some kind of um, uh, I don't know how to say that. Um, uh, uh plate boundary also yes yes it is a plate boundary definitely and you can see on the left here it says african plate 
and on the right it says Arabian plate. Yes, definitely. That's why we call it a transform fault. Ah, okay, okay. That's the composition. That oh, to be uh, clear, well, not every transform fault are uh, are a plate boundary. For example, okay. at medium scale, if I look at uh, strike slip fault. Uh, maybe it's it uh, is it possible to call it also as transfer fault or is it not no. correct? So you have two categories as we discussed: transfer and transcurrent. Transfer must link other structures. It could be a little fault, as you've seen with those guy. Uh, the, you could see the shoes of that guy. So a little fault that connects two extensional fractures, for instance. We call it a transfer fault. It could be a big transfer fault. The transform faults are a, a special case of the transfer faults because the transform faults, they are plate boundaries, okay? So not all transfer faults are plate boundaries, only the ones we call transform faults, okay? Gabriel, I, I didn't okay. want to scare okay, you. Okay, yes. Yes, I, okay. I get. Thank you. All right. Now so I'm gonna answer. Transfer. I'm gonna answer a question that Maria asked, and as you know, the uh, the water in the Dead Sea is very salty. So basically, you cannot drown in the Dead Sea, even if you don't know how to swim. You cannot drown because it's so salty that you are gonna float. <laughs> It's uh, uh, the density of the water is higher, yeah? So you are gonna float in the Dead Sea, but you don't wanna get the water in your eyes because it's gonna be terrible. And um, it has a huge concentration, like a very large concentration of salt. That's why it's so salty, yeah? Unusually salty. Um, yes, uh, so I, uh, David asked me a question. I'm gonna follow up uh, answering Maria's question. So it has a large concentration of salts. The reason that it has a large concentration of salts is that it doesn't have an inflow uh, of water. Uh, so you don't have rivers uh, bringing fresh water and you know uh, decreasing the concentration. And then what happens is that um, that um, you have the sedimentary layers in the region. And the sedimentary layers contain evaporites. So evaporites are salt layers. Yeah, it could be uh, various salts, could be sodium chloride, but maybe magnesium or potassium chloride as well. So that's the reason that basically dissolved, it dissolved the salts from the layers uh, that are there. And it doesn't have a, a significant influx of fresh water to basically uh, diminish the concentration because of the large concentration. Now, David, David's question is that nothing lives in it, the, like a fish. Yeah, it's too salty, so they cannot basically um, they cannot live. So that's the idea. With this, um, uh, even if it has a bit like the Jordan River uh, flows into it, it, you have so much evaporation that you know it it just does matter. Uh, it may uh, it may basically lower with time the level of the of the Dead Sea if you have too much evaporation because it's a desert, so it ha has very little precipitation, uh, if any. So whatever influx of fresh water it has, it doesn't matter because the balance is you get a lot evaporated. So what comes in at least that amount gets evaporated. So you can see uh, here very nicely the fault and basically the plate boundary as uh, <laughs> you see the Dead Sea. But as um, uh, Gabriel was asking, yes, this is a plate boundary. We have the African plate, including the Sinai Peninsula uh, with the Arabian plate here, but also very interesting, yeah, the formation, the formation of the Red Sea here. Um, we go through this Gulf of Aqaba and uh, the Red Sea starts here. All right, so this is very famous. Now, I have to tell you a bit, we are gonna be done uh, a few more slides and uh, we are gonna finish. 
um, we are still talking about the bends and the step overs. What happens in these regions where you have either extension or compression, when people looked at seismic reflection images, yeah, they saw basically how at the depth these faults, extensional or uh, you know or reverse faults, uh, form in these regions of bends or stepovers, and you see basically you have one main fault, yeah, uh, and from from this main fault uh, diverge or merge into it. Uh, these structures, these extensional or compressional structures, and people call them flower structures, yeah, because they look like this flower structures. And you can have a negative one if it's extension, and you see the the surface drop down, or you can have a positive one, yeah. So, so you will encounter this term. I told you that you are going to learn some terminology in this class, and you will encounter it in um, in the literature yeah so that's why i want you to know about this so in the same context because this is where things happen yeah the action happens where we have bends and step overs and that's why we talk a, uh, a lot about this um, as we discussed we we have contraction or extension yeah you look at this dextral fold and you see here the step over uh, as it is to the right or to the left here and you can you can see extension here and contraction uh yeah here so also the the this situation this deformation situation this regime is also called transpression in this case where you have the compression yeah and transtension where you have the extension so you will uh, you will encounter these uh, words as well. Uh, we we this because what you'll see in the geological literature, you will see something like this. In that region, the structures were formed in a transtensional uh, environment or in a transpressional environment. So what this has to tell you basically, it has to tell you that you have two components. Yeah, basically. You have one which leads to extension or compression and one which leads to strike slip. So you can decompose basically the, uh, the movement into this. That's the idea, transpression and transtension. And Fawson, Fawson made like a generalization. I think it's very good because this opens the horizon to you and you have to think, okay, the idea of transpression and trans tension does not have to be restricted to fault bands, not only when we have strikes in faults and bands. Yeah, you can think about this. These are the, the end members. So the end members are strike slip or simple shear, you know, so, so contraction and extension. So in between, if you have a component of strike slip and contraction as well. So a combination of these two components, you are in a regime of transpression. Now, and if you have a component of strike slip and one of extension, you are in a regime of transtension. So when I sh I've shown you the first image with the San Andreas fault, and I re referred to it when I was answering um, Gabriel, you remember those little ridges it's a transpressional environment. So you have the dominant strike slip component, but also a compressional one, a component of compression there. So the, the regime is transpressional, yeah? So that's the idea. I, I know it might seem a bit confusing, but all you have to do is learn the terminology and understand what it refers to, yeah? Mechanically speaking, and then things would be clear. They are basic terms, so I want you to know them. They are really important terms, these ones. All right, now, finally, finally, um, two more slides. Here, it's a summary, if you want. It's a summary of what we discussed in this strike-slip regime 
and the bends and the step overs. Yeah, you see here uh, a bend, you see here a step over. So here the formation of a pull apart basin. Here the the regime of trans tension along uh, around uh, along this band. Yeah, um, here you have basically uh, these folds being formed because here you have a regime of transpression associated with this band. So mechanically, when you look at it, you understand these aspects. Yeah. So this is this block diagram is like a, like a, let's say a summary of what we discussed so that you see all these situations and the combinations of them. And when we come to, uh, you see, the insert indicates the principal directions of compression and tension in relation to the main fold. Yeah. So just for you to have an idea. And now the last slide, I want it to be a transition to our new uh, our new section, the one where we start talking about origins, which, you know, it's kind of the most complex aspect we are going to discuss about uh, the origins. And in this context, I'm going to show you some cool strike slip faults. Yeah. Uh, what we, we, we see here, we see an image of Asia. Yeah. And we see an image of uh, the Indian so-called subcontinent, and I discussed this with Gabriel uh, last time after the class he stayed, and we discussed a bit about this. And we have the Indian subcontinent pushing yeah, into the um, Asian plate. And as a result of this continental collision, we have this big origin we call it the Himalayas. Now, many, many things happened with the formation of the Tibetan plateau and all these responses to these uh, stresses that were transferred. But here is something interesting. If you look at the insert, there is um, uh, a scientist called Taponier, and you see a long time ago in the 80s, 80s, in 1986, he did an experiment. He, with plasticine, so this was analog modeling, so he had an indenter pushing into this block of plasticine, and he mapped the structures uh, that are being formed. Now, there is one catch to this, to this setup. As you can see, the setup uh, had a box, like in this box, the plasticine couldn't go to the north, couldn't travel to the north. So it was fixed there, fixed to the left, but to the right, it had space. To, to move to the right if it wanted. So when, when he pushed the indenter here, he noticed these blocks basically moving in the part where they could escape, where they could go, yeah? And they, he noticed also the development of many, of a, of a system, complex system of strike slip uh, faults along structures along which this movement was happening. And he drew an analogy. That's why he was doing this experiment. He was trying to see what he gets in a controlled situation in the laboratory and compare it with the structures we see in this part of the world. And as you can see in China, we have some very, uh, very large uh, strike slip structures which accommodate this movement, which is called crustal escape, and this type of tectonics is called escape tectonics. Yeah, and kinematically, it explains basically what happens in this very extremely complex uh, part of the world. You see many subduction zones here uh, in Indochina, and um, basically how the movement uh, proceeds. Yeah, in response to the collision uh, that led to the formation of the Himalayas. So I, I think that with this slide, I wanted to transfer you, your uh, minds and put together a lot of things that we discussed in this section. And we will move to this complexity of, you know, of the formation of orogens and looking at tectonics and, and li linking all these regimes, yeah? Extensional, contractional, strike slip and so on. Because in the end, you will be the future generation to understand better these things, I would say. All right, so this is it for today. I think we are a bit early, but that's good.
um, we will continue with the new section on uh, on Thursday. And uh, then next week, if nothing changes, we will follow the situation. If nothing changes, we'll have a test on Tuesday and I'll talk to you on Thursday about it. Um, but meanwhile, enjoy the, these sections. Yeah, so please look through these uh, books uh, to consolidate a bit the, the terminology we discussed. And if you have any questions, uh, con mucho gusto. Uh, teacher, may I ask you a, a question about the last uh, diapositiva, the last slide? Uh, yeah, definitely. Let me just uh, start it again. Let me find it. Where are we? Okay. Here. Uh, this one? That one. Yes, I, I'm sorry if you already explained this, but what does the triangles mean along the borders that we are looking at? The triangles that are above. Uh... Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yes, one. No, I haven't explained this. Uh, this is um, this is how to put it a general symbol for either subduction zones. So in the context of uh, of this, we are talking about about subduction zones, and this is a collision zone. So in, on the geologic maps, when you have thrust faults, or in this case where you have subduction zone, uh, uh, subduction zones, this symbol is used. And basically, the little triangles, they indicate the part which is above. Okay, so here is the thing. Uh, the thrust here, if you look at the Himalaya front, the thrust is that the region here to the north is above the region to the south. So the fault, basically, the, the hanging wall of the fault is in the direction where the triangles point. So yes. the Tibetan plateau will be higher than the Himalayan plateau. Yes, point. yes, the Tibetan plateau is above. Yes. Now here, when we talk about subduction zones, as you can see here in Indochina and in the Philippines here, in the subduction zone, the triangles the, indicate the part which is above, and the the part which doesn't have triangles is the part that subducts. So in this case. Uh, if you look at, uh, at this part of Indochina, this part to the left from the Indian Ocean subducts under this region where we have Indonesia. And in the Philippines, this part, the, the Pacific plates, subducts under the uh, Philippine ar archipelago. Yeah. So, so this is a symbol. It's an international symbol for these thrust faults. And you can understand the subduction uh, the subduction zone as a thrust fault as well. All right. Okay. So, so that's, uh, you're, you're welcome, Juan, no problem. And uh, David. Um, yes, everything is clear now. Thank you, teacher. Okay, you are welcome. Have if you have any questions, no problem. Gabriel, uh, are you okay? Or uh, would like to discuss something else? Yes, uh, no, sorry, teacher. I would like to to ask you a favor uh, to to make a summary. How do you describe a, a transparent fault in general? A, tra a transparent fault? Well, as we discussed, the transparent fault is a strike slip fault. So it is a strike slip fault, but which has uh, ends. That, yeah, that are called free ends in the sense that it doesn't connect with other structures. So it doesn't transfer the movement from, let's say, one normal fault to another normal fault. It is just a freestanding fault. Uh, as we, you remember when we discussed about faults in general, we were saying that faults have a beginning and an end. They don't go infinitely. In, and we talked about normal faults, reverse faults, and so on. In the case of strike slip faults, you have this type of faults, the transparent faults. We call them transparent faults. Como cola de caballo. No, or yes, uh... cola de. See, I'll I'll tell you about the cola de caballo horse tail uh, in a bit. So you have these faults that don't transfer the movement. 
and they can end they can end with this so you might ask me how do they end and you i might say well at some point the displacement is zero and you might have plastic deformation beyond that but you might have a termination they curve and there is a termination with several structures where basically the movement is ending and then they they, they have a called horse tail cola de caballo i don't know if in spanish i mean i understand cola de caballo but i i don't know if in Spanish, in the geology uh, terminology, they, yes. they call it like this. Yeah, we have to find it out. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> I don't know. So, about that. so they are they are they, they are basically the typical fault. The other faults that we call transfer faults are ba basically making the connection between structures. Yeah, between structures that are like a system fault. Yes. So that's the idea system sorry ah, okay thank you teacher you're welcome you. so you're gonna have the laboratory now no no i i i'm allowed to rest now all oh, right no but what i meant to say because uh, i don't know on thursdays or or tuesdays you have laboratory yeah uh, at some point in the afternoon um uh, Thursdays. Thursdays. Oh, okay. Thursdays. Yeah, it's once a week. Once a week. Okay, good. You have to rest. Uh, I don't know how how it feels for you to see all these problems now in Colombia. Um, it's incredible. I think I'm very ignorant. As uh, for example, today earlier, uh, yes, uh, uh, on on waves and fluids matter uh, in yes. the class. Uh, or, uh, of the waves and fluid and fluid matter, yes. um, we were discussing all these things, and I said, I stated that uh, this must happen uh, because yes, I I know that the uh, la reforma tributaria, the yes. uh, it's it's injustice. Uh, Sorry, I'm just no. Es injusta. I, I voy a hablar en español, profe, porque me trago mucho. Sí, tú puedes Entonces, hablar. Um, si yo no comprendo, yo voy a decirte. Ok. Eh, pero eh, varios compañeros me explicaron que era más que solo eso. Y que realmente, realmente era, era terrible. Y me explicaron que el gobierno intentó pasar como también otros proyectos de ley de reformas muy, muy, muy negativas para, la, para las personas. Y ahí fue cuando entendí por qué está ocurriendo todo esto. Adicionalmente, la, la, la fuerza pública también ha, ha sido un poco, se ha visto un poco desbordada. Entonces, ha maltratado también a las personas. Entonces, yo no sabía eso. Y ahora pero, por qué. Pero, pero la reforma es como ellos dicen que ahora van a revisar. Pero yo no tengo. La van a revisar. El problema es que hay muchos partidos, eh, digamos. Uh, yo no quiero verme como una persona que apoya a la izquierda porque no soy así. Pero digamos que en este momento hay muchos partidos de derecha que están apoyando al gobierno y que la, esos partidos se habían puesto en contra del gobierno con la reforma tributaria porque no los tuvieron en cuenta. Hay un partido, por ejemplo, que se llama Cambio Radical. Es un partido uh -huh. muy importante. Tiene muchos congresistas en el Congreso y, y es, un, es un partido clave para el gobierno para poder aprobar, aprobar sus leyes. Ese partido dijo que no apoyaba al gobierno solo porque no lo tuvieron en cuenta a la hora de redactar el documento de proyecto de ley. Entonces, ¿qué quiere decir? Eh, o sea, a mi modo de ver, ellos lo único que querían, que querían era participación en, en esa cuestión. Si ellos hubiesen tenido participación, muy posiblemente hubiesen, eh, ¿cómo es que se llama? Eh, apoyado esa reforma, aun cuando hubiese sido totalmente injusta. Entonces, hay ahí como una especie de negociación de, de reparto de, del poder. 
Entonces, como no los tuvieron en cuenta, entonces no apoyan. ¿Qué quiere decir? Que si los hubiesen tenido en cuenta, entonces sí la apoyarían, es terrible. Porque si todos los partidos de derecha se unen, sí pueden aprobar una cosa tan terrible como esa. Y eso es lo grave. Eso es lo grave. Sí. Ojalá no, no ocurra. Y, no. Sí, pero... Y porque yo creo que Colombia... Es un país eh, que viene con problemas también de educación, donde las personas desconocen los beneficios que tienen actualmente. Actualmente hay un modelo mixto, cosas públicas y cosas privadas. Por ejemplo, eso de que usted dice de las EPS es cierto. Las EPS de momento no son las mejores, pero las personas tienen completamente la salud asegurada en el momento de cualquier suceso si pagan su salud. Pero si se lo dejan solo los seguros, entonces empiezan a haber límites en cuanto a lo que cubren dichos seguros y entonces muchas personas se pueden ver perjudicadas. Mientras que la EPS es un sistema mixto donde el garante es el Estado, uno le paga al Estado y después ese dinero va a, pagar al sector, eh, va a parar al sector privado. Pero el Estado es el garante de que a uno le presten la salud. Y si el sí. costo de un tratamiento supera lo que uno paga, no importa, uno va a tener acceso igualmente porque el Estado es el garante, porque la salud sigue siendo pública, solo que la prestación del servicio es privada. Mientras que si lo vuelven completamente privado, empiezan a haber límites que empiezan a perjudicar. Y eso yo no lo no, sabía seguro. hasta hoy. Hasta hoy lo supe. Y eso me parece terrible. Terrible de este gobierno. Entonces, sí, vamos sí. a ver cómo, cómo avanza. Y también impuestos a las pensiones de las personas.